to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Yukari Kunisue. In our show this time, we'll take you to the 41st Annual Paul Chung Memorial Lecture, presented at the Waikiki Prince Hotel by PAMI, the Pacific Asian Management Institute at the Scheidler College of Business. The event features remarks by Professor Tae Wung Baik on international human rights law and enforced disappearances with a focus on Asia, Korea, and the UN Human Rights Council. Dr. Taeyun Baik was born in South Korea and graduated from Seoul National University College of Law. He earned his Master's and Doctorate of Law in International Human Rights Law from Notre Dame Law School. He was admitted to the bar in New York and worked for Human Rights Watch as a research intern and consultant with a focus on human rights problems in North and South Korea. In 2003, he served as a legal advisor to the South Korean delegation to the UN Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. Since 2015, he has been serving as a member of the UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances. Dr. Bike joined the William S. Richardson School of Law at UH in 2011 and teaches international human rights, international criminal law, comparative law, and Korean law. He conducted research on human rights issues as a visiting scholar at the East Asian Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law School from 2002 to 2003 and is currently on sabbatical as a visiting scholar at Seoul National University Law Research Institute. Professor Bike was engaged in the democracy movement against the military dictatorship in 1980s and 1990s in South Korea. His book, Emerging Regional Human Rights Systems in Asia, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2012. The translated and updated version of this book was published in Korea last year under the title, Seeking the Human Rights Community in Asia. Here are some excerpts from his remarks at the recent Paul Chung Memorial Lecture. Today, I think we have the honor to hear from someone who has truly demonstrated the courage of their convictions at a very great personal cost. Um, he continues to battle for human rights around the globe, and I'm sure you're going to find his remarks moving, inspiring, and thought-provoking, not only for their international implications, but also in the context of recent events in the U.S. political landscape. My security is already divided. I thought I should start, however, uh, talking, confessing about my personal uh, story. Yes, I have a, a criminal records, actually, too. <laughs> so uh, I have two stars, in, in fact, according to uh, convict's words. And uh, however, I'm not too much uh, you know, ashamed of that because it was a part of the democratization process in South Korea in 1980s and 90s. Two of the former prison, uh, presidents were imprisoned during uh, this uh, democratization period. And I was also uh, part of the great um, democratization movement, and I'm proud of that. Well, my first imprisonment was in 1984, uh, when I was the president of a uh, student association of Seoul National University. I was a college of law senior student, and I was imprisoned because uh, I tried to change the election system of student association from indirect voting to direct voting. In 2009, finally, the government recognized my activities as a, uh, an act to restore uh, constitutional order and contributing to uh, promote uh, freedom and rights in uh, Korea. I'm uh, feeling honored for that. And in 2015, I was also invited and appointed to be the uh, in independent expert of UN Human Rights Council uh, that deals with the enforced disappearance. And uh, uh, the working group actually is uh, one of the pr prominent uh, gr uh, in international human rights law uh, institution in UN system. And so I'm frequently uh, traveling, uh, dealing with uh, international human rights issues, including enforced disappearances. You, as a UN uh, expert, I also see a lot of uh, tragedies that are still going on uh, in this world. So I would like to share my views, how 
the world is functional and all this functional and what should be done, what shouldn't, what we can do together. I uh, want to uh, use this as a definition of human rights. So I focused on two elements. On the one hand, norms and values adopted by international community is considered as international human rights law body, but it is supported by the belief of the, the, the conviction that human being has a special entitlement based upon human dignity. I'm trying to convey the basic idea of human rights. First of all, what we call human rights law are generally uh, related to international human rights treaties or customary international law or uh, other soft law that are developing into international law. So Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I'm sure you have heard of this. It, this is a declaration on human rights, which means that it is not treaty. However, most of these provisions, including right to life and uh, right to not to be subject to torture, these are all now considered as a customary international law. Additionally, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and Economic, Social, Cultural Rights and other key human rights treaties are actually the body of human rights law. Right to laser, for example, is a uh, human rights because it is written in economic, social, cultural rights. Women's rights, children's rights, right not to subject to torture, right uh, uh, not to be subject to enforced disappearances or rights of migrant workers, disability related work, uh, rights. We have uh, already set international human rights and uh, UN member states are under the obligation of all of UN related human rights uh, projects. Additionally, those states who ratified these human rights treaties are under special treaty obligation to be subject to treaty. As you know, uh, there are uh, six principal organs like a uh, Security Council, General Assembly, International Court of Justice, and Secretary Gen General's Office. And uh, there is no principal organ of uh, Human Rights Council in that chart. But in 2005 and 2006, uh, eventually, uh, the world agreed to establish Human Rights Council under the General Assembly uh, branch because uh, if they want to make Human Rights Council as a principal organ, the Charter of UN should be amended. The definition of enforced disappearance is a very, very uh, restrictive and very uh, important. As you see from the method of work, uh, we have this definition of enforced disappearances. Enforced disappearances occur when persons are arrested detained or abducted against their will or otherwise deprived of their liberty by officials of different branches or levels of government or by organized groups or private individuals acting on behalf of or with the support, direct or indirect, consent or acquiescence of the government, followed by a refusal to disclose the fate or whereabouts of the person's concerned or refusal to acknowledge the deprivation of their liberty. <laughs>
It consists of three elements. On the one hand, it should be done by officials of different branches, and there should be a support, direct or indirect, consent or acquiescence of the government. So this is a very, very technically uh, challenging uh, concept, especially if uh, disappearance is done by ISIS, which is not governmental entity. If uh, disappearance is done by gangster group being supported by Mexican government, if it is done by so-called self-proclaimed People's Republic of Donetsk or Lugansk in Ukraine, are they enforced disappearances if any disappearances are conducted? Secondly, the, the definition, uh, another element of definition is arrest, arrest detention, or abduction, uh, which uh, uh, amounts to deprivation of liberty. And the third part is refusal uh, to disclose the fate or whereabouts. So these are the, actually the topic and the issue that we are struggling all the time, or trying to wrestle to determine whether a case that has been recently reported are enforced disappearance or, or not, and whether a state is under the obligation to report back the results of their investigation to us. The theoretical issues also come up, which as a law professor I enjoy tremendously, but it's not easy. For example, uh, we had uh, recently discussed whether we have a jurisdiction to de uh, deal with uh, massacres in 1920s that has happened in Armenian massacre context. Can we go back to 30s or 40s before UN was established? Or is it legally possible, but it's pol is it political decisions? Uh, many of the ri migrant workers or trafficking victims uh, encounter uh, problems, including enforced disappearances. And in the United States, for example, if uh, a border crosser from Mexico is uh, expelled from U.S. border guard to desert, but those traffickers are already left, they are not given any water or anything, they are actually put to death by that kind of situation. In this situation, who should be responsible? Should the United States be responsible for not giving proper protection to those uh, migrants? Or should the Mexican government or individual actors who are smuggling people? So it's complicated issues. And how can we fill the protection gap in this kind of situation? And furthermore, many countries use their domestic legal system, like national security law, counterterrorism law, to justify so-called incommunicado detention without notifying their family members, the whereabouts of the people, they arrest people, detain people, interrogate. And they say that these are legal under their legal system. Un international perspective does not acknowledge it as legal, but many countries are still using this practice. And how can we just eradicate this practice? And that is one of the big topics that I am uh, continuously uh, thinking, uh, working on. Sometimes security challenge of North Korea can be used as a justification not to focus on human rights issues. Sometimes to achieve a normalization of a relationship, they decide not to mention human rights issues. These two different, and sometimes humanitarian causes are also disregarded. How can we handle this? At this time, President Trump met uh, Kim Jong-un, and these are mainly focused on security issues. And South Korean President, North Korean uh, Kim, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un also met, and they are more focused on security issue and human rights issue are not properly covered. And how can we achieve this uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, goal to protect human rights while achieving human, uh, security guarantees and uh, achieving peace regimes in the countries? Interesting case recently developed in South Korea is a. Uh, the case of a Ryugyong restaurant. These are North Korean workers who are working for Ryugyong restaurant in China, and they are seduced, or some of them were persuaded with, without full consent to come to South Korea. They entered into South Korea uh, under former presidency 
uh, and they, there is a strong allegation that South Korean security agency solicited them to use this as a momentum in their election process. And now North Korea demands the return of these papers, claiming that this is enforced disappearances. And South Korean Unification Ministry is still arguing that they came according to their will, and there is no uh, violation of international law. However, civil society uh, is going against that uh, statement at this time. And finally, National Human Rights Commission in South Korea decided to interview those people to learn uh, what was their uh, real reason to come, or whether it, there was, has been consent, and who had been uh, involved in this process. With regard to North Korea, a lot of enforced disappearance cases had registered. During Korean War, many South Korean people were abducted uh, when Korean War were going on. Needless to say, it's important that we all keep current on human rights and enforce disappearance and the influence of American foreign policy on those issues, especially now. This talk was a valuable contribution to the public conversation on the subject and consistent with the long-standing mission of PAMI and the Scheidler College of Business to raise global awareness in Hawaii. If you want to know more about Taeyun Bike or the William S. Richardson School of Law, check out law.hawaii.edu. If you want to know more about the annual Paul Chung Memorial Lecture or the Scheidler College of Business, check out pami.scheidler.hawaii.edu. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech streams its talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we stream our earlier shows all night long, and some people watch them all night long. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, 
They're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio, and we post all our programs as podcasts and iTunes. We also now have an app for your cell phone. You can download it on either your iPhone or your Android. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during our shows, call 808-374-2014. Help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we would like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. And now, here's this week's Think Tech commentary. I'm very concerned about this, and I think this man has done incredible things to undermine our democracy in a relatively short period of time. So the question is, who can do what? That's the ultimate question. Um, I suppose you and me, we use our brain cells, we do critical thinking, we write op-ed pieces, we have shows and opinions, you know, like this, editorials like this, and that may help, but there should be a lot more of it. Um, do you think, Tim, that the, the press in general has done a good job in responding? I mean, I, I admire the New York Times because no matter what he says about them, they keep on plunging ahead. They keep on reporting the lies. They keep on reporting it as they see it. And that's a, sort of an example of good journalism. Other newspapers are intimidated. Other newspapers don't like to cover it. Other, other media, you know, frankly, they're not as courageous. I was gratified to see all those 350 editorials. That was a statement of togetherness. Some of the newspapers didn't want to publish that. They thought that they would be criticized as being part of a cabal, you know, a press cabal. Uh, <laughs> And, and therefore, they should not participate in what was, uh, you know, a planned uh, maneuver by large numbers of media. Uh, but in fact, I think the media has to respond to what he's been doing. He's, he's the one who started this war. It's not a war with the press. It's a war on the press. And the press should respond. Otherwise, the confusion is perpetuated. Well, Jay, you, you keep using this word confusion, and I think it's the appropriate exact word to use. We've had in history these points of confusion where the press ought to have done more to make things less confused. I'll talk about the Gulf War and how those questions weren't being asked properly during the Gulf War. I'll talk about the point of confusion and the clarification that came from Edwin R. Murrow when a, a Joseph McCarthy was basically casting everyone as a communist. Those were points of confusion. And the press ultimately did their best. Well, we want to see more happening about this. Uh, I hate to see him make these outrageous statements and uh, say that the press is lying, except his friends at Fox News. Um, I hate to see people confused. And I, I mean, I'm personally looking for a solution. And the solution is saying, all you guys get out there and read more. All you guys get out there and think more. All you guys have conversations with your friends and try to come to some kind of engagement on a, on a, on a small basis and then, and then make that a larger engagement on a larger basis to media that reach more people. Uh, that may not be enough, especially in Hawaii. People are very respectful of authority. Uh, they uh, do not want to make, uh, make A. They do not want to go out in public and commit themselves. They don't want to seem to be angry. So culturally, we don't do much of that. I like to see us do more of it, honestly. Um, the problem is the media themselves. The media are our agents in this. The, the fact is the media represent us. They represent us in getting the information and in proliferating the information and in protecting us from lies. Uh, they have to go out there and do that somehow. It is not merely a matter of, of, of printing all the news that's fit to print, which is the New York Times motto. It's a matter of looking at the whole landscape and trying to figure out how these various statements and outrageous maneuvers are affecting our democracy and call a spade by spade. You know, we, we don't do that enough. There are a number of columnists, <clears throat> I won't mention them, in the, in the New York Times and the Washington Post that address this on a regular basis, and that's to their credit.
We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. The Atherton Family Foundation, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Hawaiian Electric Companies, the High Tech Development Corporation, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Integrated Security Technologies, Kamehameha Schools, Dwayne Carisu, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sidney Stern Memorial Trust, the Volo Foundation, Eureka J. Sugimura. Okay, Yukari, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos, and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a host or guest, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii, and of course, Hawaii's strategic position and vulnerability in the Asia-Pacific region. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important episode. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Yukari Kunisue. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.